Behind David Letterman's relaxed and amusing public appearance, there is a story as captivating and hilarious as his non-stop top 10 list. Let's take a closer look at the man behind the late show desk, from his eyebrow-raising marriages to late-night show rivalry. The sad truth about David Letterman's relationship with his wife, early life. Legendary U.S. showman David Letterman was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, the center of America's heartland, in 1947. He was a middle child among his sisters, Elizabeth and Maria. David was born to Harry Joseph Letterman and Dorothy Marie Letterman Mengering. Harry was a florist with a friendly demeanor, while Dorothy was a secretary at the Second Presbyterian Church of Indianapolis. His formative years were spent on Indianapolis's north side, the Broad Ripple area in particular, where model car collection, especially racing cars, was his hobby at that time. In interviews, he expressed his fondness for his father's gift of humor, welcoming jokes to any feast. On the one hand, mortality's gloomy image grew large over the family after David's father survived a heart attack when David was three years old. This sense of helplessness created a deep-rooted fear of losing their beloved father, which subsequently determined the way he perceived his world as he continued to grow. Unfortunately, Harry passed away when he was 57, owing to a second heart attack in 1973. Losing his father greatly impacted David, but he managed to turn his grief into motivation and make something of himself. As a teenager, Letterman worked a few evening shifts at the Atlas supermarket, which developed his work discipline and fortitude. Even though he eventually decided to attend Indiana University, his academic performance pushed him toward Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. There, he also joined the Sigma Chi fraternity, and he graduated in 1969 from the Department of Radio and Television. Letterman just humbly looked at himself as just an average student. Therefore, later on in his life, he created and endowed a scholarship that was specifically designed for the sort that he fondly calls C students. After Letterman finished college, he began his second career as a radio station anchor and weatherman at WBST Student Radio Station, which is located in Ball State University. He received some attention for his unpredictable on-air behavior, which included congratulating a tropical storm for being upgraded to a hurricane and predicting hailstones the size of canned hams moving to Los Angeles. In 1975, the Sigma Chi brothers inspired David Letterman to move to Los Angeles, California, with the comedy writing dream in his mind. He packed his belongings into a pickup truck and drove to the glittering city of dreams. Letterman dedicated that time to participating in the comedy scene, and he was on the stage at the most famous comedy club, The Comedy Store, to refine his skills. It was in one of his moments of performance at The Comedy Store that the eye of Jimmy Walker, a comedian and actor who used to perform in the TV program Good Times, noticed Letterman. A couple of days later, he received a positive recommendation from George Miller, another comedian who liked his performance. As a result, he was placed amongst the team of writers gathered by Walker to develop material for stand-up routines. In the span of just six weeks by the scorching summer of 1977, Dave Letterman's comedy skills were good enough for him to have officially served as the writer and the regular guest on the The Starland Vocal Band Show, a presentation that was aired on CBS. He also turned his hand to creating a game show that was a reincarnation of the pilot of The Riddlers in 1977, but unfortunately, they never made it to see the light of day. He started to prove his acting potential even more by appearing in the Barry Levinson-produced comedy program titled Peeping Times, which made its appearance on American television on January 1978. A while later, Letterman graced the small screen as a cast member on Mary Tyler Moore's variety show, Mary. It meant he was one more step closer to being an icon in the entertainment industry. In his brief cameos on Mork and Mindy, a popular sitcom, he marvelously played around the character that portrayed the infamous leader, Werner Erhard. In addition to that, he successfully implemented his sparkling cleverness on several game shows, including The $20,000 Pyramid, The Gong Show, and Password Plus. Not limiting himself to the television medium, Letterman went further and made an intercontinental trip to Canada to host the 1978 episode of the cooking show Celebrity Cooks in November. 
Whether it was in the UK or the US, he was always the most coveted humorous guest on shows like 90 Minutes Live and The Mike Douglas Show, which then gave people the opportunity to see his trademark sharp wit and comedic faces. In addition to his successful days on the small screen, Letterman also had a shot at acting on the big screen, where he auditioned for the lead role of the 1998 film Airplane. However, the role finally went to Robert Hayes. In hindsight, though, it was Letterman being on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson, which turned out to be the main thing that skyrocketed him to national awareness, which is why Carson is the person he credits for setting him on the path to success in Hollywood. Late Night with David Letterman NBC thought it was the right time to try a new experiment with the incredible comic David Letterman. They decided to keep him but try out different time slots. Thus, Late Night with David Letterman was put in place on February 1, 1982. Bill Murray was one of the first guests to appear on the stage, impressing the crowds with his unmatched humor. With Murray's continued appearance on Letterman's subsequent shows as a guest, including celebrations like the 30th anniversary of his late-night television career in 2012 and the final CBS broadcast in 2015, it was emphasized that the two were grot friends. Airing Monday through Thursday nights at 12 a.m., the unexpected and humorous show gained devoted followers, especially among college students. The true colors of Letterman's sharp wit and sometimes even sarcastic style suddenly showed up during conversations with guests like Cher, Shirley MacLaine, Charles Grodin, or Madonna. The show's format, which is massively influenced by Steve Allen's classic TV works, was an amazing mixture of comedy sketches, recurring characters, and evergreen features. Meanwhile, the most funny part was stupid pet tricks and stupid human tricks, which were from Letterman's earlier morning show. The crowd did not fail to enjoy free-falling of stuff such as cake, lettuce, and bricks, as well as unusual dressing patterns, including one person with a suit which was comprised of Alka-Seltzer, Velcro, and suet. The main characters of the show, the Top Ten List, Monkey Cam, and Small Town News, further helped retain the show's funny and unique tone. To make viewers laugh and appreciate each segment, they are brought up with wit and creative technique. The show's traditional establishment antics came to a climax in 1985 with the infamous bullhorn interruption of a live interview on The Today Show, where he masqueraded as NBC News President Lawrence K. Grossman and made the audacious claim of being pantsless. But the episode that had the greatest backlash was the one featuring the immortal showdown between Andy Kaufman and pro wrestler Jerry Lawler in 1982. While wearing a neck brace, Kaufman delivered this perfect slap. Somehow, Lawler Leroy managed to put him down, even though he was revealed to be an ally of Kaufman. His trailblazing reputation in the industry was cemented through and through during that show, and thus, not a bit of doubt remained as to the future of his brilliant career. Late Show with David Letterman After the departure of Johnny Carson from his host duties in 1992, a major upheaval occurred across the television domain, with speculative discussions revolving around David Letterman taking on the coveted position of The Tonight Show host. Even Johnny himself and the admirers were certain that David would take over. While the unanticipated choice of Jay Leno over Letterman had occurred, nobody in his casual group had entertained the prospect of him or his fans leaving. Defying this obstacle, however, the risk-taker made a daring offer to the NBC network. He announced himself as the host of his own late-night show on CBS. Positioned to rival The Tonight Show, The Late Show with David Letterman made its first appearance in the same studio where the entertaining Ed Sullivan's variety series was filmed, the famous Ed Sullivan Theater itself. For Letterman's arrival, CBS spent around $8 million in renovations. CBS also signed Letterman to a three-year, $14 million per year contract, which was more than twice his salary earned in late night. Though audiences looked up to Letterman to introduce the customary wit and unorthodox humor into the program, Late Show took on the traditional format, which had been seen on several other such programs. The monologue was made longer, enabling Letterman to showcase his comedic talent clearly. In addition, Paul and the world's most dangerous band were with him at CBS, 
with the addition of a brass section and a rebranding as the CBS Orchestra at Schaffer's behest. This move, however, represented a deviation from the small Decker ensemble that marked Carson's tenure and provided Letterman with the chance to establish a new identity for his show. In the meantime, even though some parts of Letterman's NBC production could be easy to sail over and move on to CBS, it still wouldn't work the way it should because of copywriting disputes. However, the challenges that he faced simply encouraged him even more cleverly to change the format of his old segments, making them modern with a different point of view. The key UPSI Patier's Top 10 list became the Late Show Top 10. But despite these micro-changes, Letterman was able to create and evolve his own style within the traditional boundaries of a television talk show. While the stampeded framework of the talk show was present, Time magazine claimed it was the basis for Letterman's innovative decisions. However, a biographer of his, Jason Zinneman, stated that the late-night talk show was a uniquely gloomy show with an eccentric and always grumpy host. Ultimately, his distinctive mannerisms and style distinguished Letterman's show from the traditional one. Regina Lasko was left heartbroken. Regina Lasko was confident that she would one day become David Letterman's wife, but sadly, her dream was shattered. Letterman's marital wanderings began with Michelle Cook, his girlfriend from college, with whom he tied the knot in 1969. However, their partnership was terminated approximately nine years later. Letterman's course in Amour took a different path when he happened to see Meryl Marco, the chief comedy writer on his show, while still married to Cook. It wasn't until 1986, during a coincidence that took place while sports commentator Marv Albert was orchestrating, that Letterman met Lasko, changing the course of his life forever. It was Lasko that Letterman noticed the same night propping up the Zamboni. At the time, she was equipment manager for the Rangers. Sometime in the year 1993, in an interview with Rolling Stone, Letterman narrated how that encounter changed his life. Through Lasko, Letterman knew a human being who would be his close ally for his entire career course. The closer Letterman became to Lasko, the more and deeper his conflict with Marco developed. As time went on, Lasko became a steady companion of Letterman, whom she joined as an equipment manager. Certainly, her status catapulted when he elevated her rank to a production manager of the program The Late Show. Despite being in love with Lasko, David could not put aside working with women, and that was again a professionalism issue, another reason for the strains in their marriage. And yet, despite the couple spending three decades together and attending social occasions side by side, Letterman kept silent on any plans for their long overdue marriage. In a 1996 interview with Rolling Stone, he said he is a turtle and has no inclination to be married. Lasko, wishing to prove that her feelings were stronger than the post-divorce depression, gave us another sign that wedding was now an option, whereas Letterman was overwhelmed by doubts because marriage had already ruined his previously happy life. In 2009, their bond became complicated by the blackmailing trial at which Letterman was the cynosure of all eyes. A regretful confession by David Letterman on The Late Show occurred, wherein he disclosed that he had engaged in extramarital affairs with women working under his employ. This made the media vibrate violently and dislodged the pillars of his life. In the course of vivid depiction, Letterman revealed a mysterious package with the screenplay and book materials, conveying confidential information about his private life to the audience. The offender insisted on a $2 million sum as a condition for withholding the embarrassing knowledge from coming into the news. He was resolute and inventive that the next moment, he advised the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and participated together with them in a sting operation to catch the extortionist. The operation came to a conclusion very soon, when Joe Halderman, a producer at the CBS News Magazine series 48 Hours, was arrested in October 2009 for attempting to deposit a fake check, a part of the string. However, indicted by a Manhattan grand jury, Halderman pleaded not guilty to the charge of attempted grand larceny. On the other hand, the power of the testimony against him was so strong that the plea was changed. Regretfully, 10 months later, Halderman found himself pleading guilty in March 2010 on account of his wrongdoings. A period of six months was imposed as his imprisonment. In the end, 
The culmination and revelation of the high-profile case was the showcase of how seriously it was taken. This crime served as a lesson for the powerful folks on how not to exploit people. Following the scandal, Letterman made a public apology to Lasco, who was hurt by his actions. He made it clear that he was sorry and expressed his guilt for causing her so much pain. Even though there was turmoil, their relationship survived due to Lasco's resilience. Letterman himself praised Lasco's extraordinary achievements in the face of peril, talking not only about her strength, but also about her impressive intellect, which helped them both make it through that toughest of times. Of all the lessons he took with him after his recovery, the most valuable one for Letterman was that of the ongoing struggle to regain the trust he broke at that time. However, in spite of this misunderstanding, he did not lose his resolve to put it right, acknowledging that all of that was made possible by Lasco. A picture of genuine partnership, their unbreakable bond is a lesson of love and forgiveness capabilities to survive the worst scenario. Hosting Academy Awards David Letterman faced the big challenge of being a host of the 67th Academy Awards on March 27, 1995. This opportunity marked the beginning of a troubling time in his career. The critics took on him, saying he was too out of tune with the formality and splendor of the Oscars, and his style of humor did not go well with it. Several of his jokes fell completely flat. Despite attracting the highest ratings to the annual telecast since 1983, Many felt that the bad publicity Letterman generated caused a decline in the late show's ratings. However, in a clever move, Letterman, instead of avoiding the controversy, artfully managed to blend it into his repertoire of funny remarks. In his first show following the Oscars, he threw up a quip, In retrospect, I do not know that my damn thing was being aired. He continued to make fun of his tenure in the later years of his show, even imitating it quite fearfully when Billy Crystal was doing an opening Oscar shred two years later. Although Letterman's detractors outnumbered those who enjoyed his stint, his fame in the entertainment world grew by leaps and bounds. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences bestowed on him the award by acknowledging his talent and influence. In the end, he was once again appointed to be the talk show host at the Oscar Awards. The impact of his Oscar performance lived on, and it was a mark for Letterman to refer to in the years after that. It was a subject that was hilarious and that became a source of regular jokes for him in the years to come. Struggles. David Letterman had to deal with certain health challenges and personal problems throughout his life that gave his path a unique character. Tinnitus, the symptom of hearing loss, is one of the major issues he has had to cope with. Letterman himself admitted that during his 1996 interviews on The Late Show with William Shatner. Just like Shatner, who once experienced severe tinnitus after an onset explosion, Letterman experiences a constant ringing in his ears. Firstly, he could not grasp the source of noise that was bothering him, which shows that tinnitus is an interfering factor in the sufferer's everyday life. Another relevant aspect of Letterman's personal journey to note is the issue of his relationship with alcohol. He admittedly was a poor alcoholic, having struggled with this substance abuse since his early years, when he was only 13 and a half and had already formed a habit of consuming alcohol. He battled his alcoholism right up to the moment in 1981 when he was 34 years of age. This is when he embraced sobriety. In his admission, Letterman described how he was drinking all the time. He was almost always under the influence and had seriously considered the idea of ending his life at one point. Apart from tinnitus and alcoholism, Letterman also faced anxiety throughout his life. He called himself anxious and hypochondriacal for many decades. He found peace through a combination of transcendental meditation and a low prescription of medication. This transformation shows his resilience in overcoming mental health problems and seeking inner peace during the tumultuous demands of his career. Despite all his personal issues, the TV host has found a way of staying grounded through his religious faith. Growing up Presbyterian at the direction of his mother, he retains a link to his spiritual orientation. Nevertheless, he also has jokingly made Lutheran and Midwestern guilt as his reason highlights his light approach to religion. In August of 2021, Letterman was admitted to the Providence Hospital in Rhode Island due to a head injury he suffered from a fall. After his stay, 
he was full of gratitude to all the staff he met at the Rhode Island Hospital. Heart Surgery On January 14, 2000, David Letterman's life took an extreme turn when a routine medical examination showed that a severe blockage was present in one of his heart arteries. Without thinking for even a second, he was rushed to New York Presbyterian Hospital for a quick surgery to take care of the critical condition. The procedure, a quintuple bypass, was complex and life-saving for him. During the first preliminary phase, when Letterman was lying in hospital recovering, reruns of the program Late Show filled the airwaves. Yet again, contrary to the notion that he was going to leave his viewers in the dark, his friends and associates saw to it that every episode was ushered in by an introductory note that directed the viewers to the promised return of the show. The stardom of the guest hosts, notably Norm MacDonald, Drew Barrymore and Robin Williams, among others, heroically continued the show in Letterman's absence, according to the spirit. Incredibly, Letterman did not give up his television show, even throughout his recovery. And it became accustomed to have guest hosts for the show since this was a practice that was lacking in the 1990s. For several weeks, the show was welcoming guests like Bill Cosby and Kathy Lee Gifford, filling in the void during Letterman's absence. There's no better way to describe his return to the scene than the re-entry. He was accompanied by the medical team, which had played a huge role in his surgery and recovery. Using his famous humor and humility, he spoke affectionately of the caregivers, joking narratives of the hospital nurse he had been attended by, for example. Without a doubt, Letterman's irrepressible joy of life went beyond the recovery from the bypass operation, and he would find general humor in it as well. Whether through funny remarks about his stent or by trying to get a bypass named after him, he continued to have his usual comeback all the time. Unbelievably, Letterman developed lasting friendships with his medical team members. Reflecting on this tough period during a 2008 Rolling Stones interview, Letterman was thankful for all the people who had once been strangers, but then became dearest and closest of friends. Retirement. During the recording of his show on April 3, 2014, David Letterman dropped a bombshell, announcing to his audience that he had notified CBS President Leslie Moonves of his decision to retire from hosting The Late Show. In his characteristic style, Letterman humorously hinted on occasions during his retirement that he had been fired, adding a touch of jest to his departure. Shortly after his announcement, it was revealed that the esteemed comedian and political satirist Stephen Colbert would step into Letterman's shoes as his successor. Letterman's final show was telecast in May 2015, concluding a bygone era in late-night television. The beginning included a presidential send-off, with four of the five living U.S. presidents, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, all repeating the late President Gerald Ford's classic words, Our long national nightmare is over. The show also included cameo appearances from popular TV shows The Simpsons and Wheel of Fortune. Of course, as the end credits rolled, one cannot help but remember the top 10 list, where prominent regular guests such as Alec Baldwin, Stephen Colbert, and Steve Martin noted their memorable experiences with Letterman, titled, Things I Wish I Could Have Said to David Letterman. There was hardly a dry eye as the luminaries each followed up on this poignant tribute with their own humor. The emotional grief echoed all around the nation, and the number of people who visited the show was no less than 13 million in America. As it turns out, Letterman was the clear winner among late-night shows on that particular night, and his farewell episode was the most-watched show on network TV that night, even beating all primetime shows an amazing proof of his magnetism and influence on the audiences. The farewell speech of Letterman paved the way for his ultimate legacy with an immense 6,080 episodes. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.